last time we talked about the first principle of the 13 principles of faith. And as we mentioned last time, these 13 principles are a certain spiritual framework within which our nation operates. And these principles, these ideals were codified by the Rambam, by Maimonides, where he lays down what are the principles of Jewish belief, what are the, so to speak, prerequisites of Jewish belief, what are the pillars, what are the foundations that are upholding our religion. And the first of those 13 principles uh, was a multi-pronged principle, but the general idea is acknowledgement, acceptance of the existence of God. The first, most important, the principle that really encompasses everything that we do, everything about Torah. Of course, if you don't have God, you can't have Torah. If you don't have a divine entity, you can't have a divinely given corpus. But that's the general idea of principle number one that we spoke about last time. And that is, again, to believe and to acknowledge in the existence of a existence or that is God, that is perfect, that lacks nothing, that created everything, that continually sustains Everything, everything else hinges upon it existing and it is not contingent upon anything else existing. If it were to cease giving vitality to everything else, everything else would cease to exist. Whereas if the opposite were true, if the world went up in a nuclear explosion, if the whole universe combusted, then God would still exist. Whereas if God were to withdraw himself from the universe, the universe would cease to exist. At the end of our discussion, we opened up with a very advanced question. And the question, the way we presented it, even though maybe there's other ways to present it, there's a more simple way to present it, but the way we presented it is that some of these ideas seem antithetical. Why? On one hand, we describe and we define the Jewish God The Jewish definition of God is an entity that is perfect, an entity that lacks nothing. On the other hand, we see that God did create the universe, did create the world, did create all the constellations in the galaxies, did create all the species, did create men. Intelligent entities don't act needlessly. So we could theorize that God, when God acted, when God created, there was a need or there was an objective that he was trying to accomplish. And that objective could not have been accomplished in some other way, could not have been, in a more philosophical term, inherently achieved. And therefore, God had to create something else, something we call it the world, which is everything that's not God. Last time we talked about there's two categories. There's God and there's everything else. And God brought everything else into existence. Why, if God is perfect, if God lacks nothing, if God is totally complete, why would God, what benefit, so to speak, does God have by creating the world, by creating anything, by bringing anything else into existence? So essentially our question is, why did God create Genesis? Why did God create the world and uh, everything that exists in it? And again, we're, we're presenting this as a natural extension of the Jewish definition of God. If God is perfect, if God lacks nothing, why indeed did God create the world? And why does not that run afoul with the fr- principle? Principle number one, God's perfect. God lacks nothing. Well, it seems like he did lack something because otherwise he wouldn't have created the world. So I want to just, before we dig into this subject, I want to stress that this is a very advanced question. And maybe the easiest answer is, is that this is something which is beyond our pay grade, so to speak. It's beyond what we can understand because we're asking why God behaved. And unless you really understand God, you can't really understand why he acts in the way he acts. So that's, I think, one easy but legitimate way to get out of the questions. So, well, this is too advanced for us. It's beyond us. We cannot possibly fathom, we cannot conceive of God's calculations and therefore we can't really ask this question. That's, I think, one way to approach the subject and say, well, it's beyond us. Throw up our hands in despair. Humans, we're mortal. 
we're, we're fallible, we're incomplete. Something which is imperfect, something which is incomplete cannot really fathom the decisions, the actions of God who is complete and is perfect. That's, I think, one way to approach it, which I, I do think it's legitimate. However, our sages did dip their toe into this question. And what we're going to try to do today is try to, I would say, assemble their answers, but understand the core of the answer and see what it tells us with relation to God and the first principle, but also I think it's a very valuable exercise because it tells us why we're here. You know, wh- what's the purpose? Such a, such a powerful question that we could be asking here. Why do I exist? What is my responsibility? What is my mission? What is my goal as an individual? What is our collective goal as a nation or as a species or as – and what's, what's the universe's goal? It's, a, it's, a, it's such a powerful question. And I think when we get the, the Torah's answer, I think it makes our life – and our goals and our activities a little bit clearer, but also more meaningful. We're not just living mindlessly, aimlessly. We're living with a goal, with a destination, and we understand how that kind of originates with the desire of God, so to speak, to create the world. So again, we're acknowledging that this is a theological dilemma. God needs nothing, yet he creates something. We're acknowledging that maybe the correct answer for this, for, this, for, uh, for this question is for us to just withdraw ourselves, but we're not going to do that. We're going to try to understand what the answer is and what the answers that were given by the great giants of Jewish philosophy and the answers that are the composite answers, which I'm going to argue is really one same answer. Um, but what are the composite uh, answers that we find in Jewish literature? So the two classical answers to this question, and again, I'm going to argue they're really one, but the two classical answers to the questions are as follows. There's a famous verse in the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, which means everything that God created, he created for his glory and for his honor. Everything that was created, everything that was formed, everything that was molded, everything that was effectuated, all of that was for the purpose of augmenting God's glory. That's one answer. Put that on on the side. There's a second answer or a second formulation of this answer, and that is that the desire of God in his creation was to give was to give pleasure, was to be benevolent, was to give to something that is not him. And the way this is presented is that God is good and something which is good wants to do good. And therefore, God wanted to do good. But because God is also perfect, God wanted the good that he wanted to give to be perfect. And consequently, God created the entire world, the entire universe in order to be able to have a receptacle, to have a uh, a vessel that can receive that godly goodness in the most perfect way. And according to both of these answers, the answer of augmenting God's glory, so to speak, and the answer of God wanting to do good, what we would say to answer our original question, we would say like this, God himself is perfect, is complete, lacks nothing. Indeed, the way the Ramam says it, the Jewish definition of God lacks nothing inherently. However, by dint of the nature of the reality of existence, when it was just God himself, there was no one else. And that, the fact that there's no one else, that does not detract from God's perfection. That does not reduce or diminish from God's completion. But just the state of existence was that there was just God and there was no one else. There was nothing else. And therefore, there was no one who could be a receptacle for God's goodness because there was nothing else that existed. That does not show a flaw or a lack in God's 
essence. Rather, it's just this natural state of existence is that there was just God, nothing else. And therefore, in order for God to give, he had to create something that can receive that goodness. In addition, looking at it from the perspective of God's glory uh, and the idea of God wanted to augment his glory, what does that mean? So the way that is classically presented in Jewish literature and Jewish philosophy is that there is a difference between a king and a dictator or an autocrat. In Hebrew, there's two words for a king. One is a melech, which means a king. And one is a moshel. A moshel means an autocrat, an entity or individual that has all the power. Both of them have control. What is the difference between a king and an autocrat? What is the difference between a king and a dictator? Again, a dictator dictates and everyone follows. A king dictates and people follow. What's the real difference? The difference is, is that a king is beloved by the people. A king is nominated by the people. The constituency promotes the king. They are desirous of the king. Whereas the autocrat, they assert their dominion, their control by brute force. Our sages tell us that before there was a universe, God was an autocrat, so to speak. God had all the power. He was perfect. He lacked nothing. There was nothing that contradicted from his power. However, there was no possibility of dissension. There was nothing else that could have rejected God's dominion. With creation of the world, and more specifically, with creation of man and man's free will, now there is a creation of an entity that can either choose to accept God or can choose to reject God. And therefore, in the event that someone does choose to accept God, they are elevating God from an autocrat, from a dictator, to a king by voluntarily, so to speak, with independent verification, choosing to accept the dominion of God, God's stature, God's glory, so to speak, God's kingdom is increased from the state of an autocracy, from the state of a dictatorship to the state of a king. So again, we have two answers that are really running parallel to each other. Both of them acknowledge that God was perfect and remained perfect all along. However, by the nature of the existence that existed before creation, there was nothing else. If there was nothing else, then there was nothing that could have made God a king because a king is dependent upon people or entities with free will choosing God or choosing a king to be a king. On the second side, God wanted to be good and God wanted to give good and God wanted to give perfect good. Well, if there's nothing to receive that good, not that God is lacking, just the reality of existence that there's nothing there. There's no humans. There's no world to receive God's goodness and therefore... God wanted to give because God is good and good wants to give. And therefore, he had to create, in order to fulfill that objective, he had to create a recipient, a receptacle of that goodness. So that's the general two strands of this question as it's answered in in Jewish philosophy. Now, the problem is, or at least one of the problems to this is that Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, is the one most famous for codifying one of those answers. The second answer, the idea of God wanting to do good, is found most prominently in the works of Ramchal. Ramchal, Rabbi Moshe Hamutzato, lived in the 18th century, 1707 to 1746. He seems to be offering a different answer. Whereas Isaiah is saying, well, it's about God's glory and augmenting God's glory. That's why he created the world. Ramchal is saying, no, it's about kind of mankind and mankind being a receptacle of, of God's kindness, of God's goodness. One thing is a bedrock principle of Jewish philosophy is that Ramchal cannot argue with Isaiah. Isaiah is a prophet and Ramchal is, of course, a great giant, great titan of Jewish philosophy, but there's no way that these two could be arguing. So I want to show, before we get into the nitty gritty of it, I want to show that really these two are, are saying the same thing but they're saying it from different perspectives. Ramchal is talking to us, and he's telling us kind of how we fit in into this distribution. 
And Isaiah is talking to you from God's perspective. And there are two cards of one process. So I want to kind of present this. And I, I do think just as a quick tangential aside, I'm, I'm, I'm going through some of the technicalities of how these two fit in. But later on, we're going to talk about the actual practical implications. So even if the technicalities sound uh, a, a little bit um, theoretical and abstract, we're going to bring it back to a more practical level in a little bit. So I want to point out, first of all, that there is an enormous overlap between these two answers. Again, the question is, why did God create the world? And we have two answers, either to augment God's glory and God's kingdom or to create a receptacle for his goodness. There's overlap with these two answers, and that is both of them are fulfilled with man. Man is the one, so to speak, who chooses God and makes God a king, upgrading him from a from a autocrat. Man is the one who's the rece- re- receptacle of God's goodness. And specifically, which element of man is this objective, is this purpose being fulfilled is specifically in man's free will. So everyone agrees that the reason why God created the world, and not just the world, the universe, and all the galaxies, and all the world, and, and all the trillion species that today roam our planet, all of that are all kind of a sideshow in the main focus of creation, and that is man, and specifically man's, man, when we say man is mankind, and specifically man's capacity to have free will, to make free will choices. So for example, the Talmud tells us that if you look at the Genesis story, you'll notice that man is created last. Everything else, the heavens, the earth, the, 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 the constellations, the trees, the all the animals are created, and then man's created. And the Talmud asks the question, why is man created last? And it gives us four different answers. And each one of these four answers plug into our question. So I'll just go quickly through these, these, uh, these answers. The first one is that, well, if man was created earlier, so suppose man was created on, on Tuesday. Well, then people would say, you know what happened on Wednesday? God created the, 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 the sun and the moon and the stars. You know who helped him with that? Man helped him with that. That's what people would say. And that's kind of really zoning in on the problem, and that is that man has the ability to reject God. The animals don't claim to be creators. The animals don't have idolatry. That's only the domain of man. The capacity of man is exhibited by the fact that had man been present earlier, man right away would have rejected God or that would have been a likely result. That's the first answer. A second answer is that the reason why man was created last is because everything was created before him. So what happens when man gets haughty and arrogant and full of hubris? What do you tell such a person? You tell him, you know who came before you? The lowly fruit fly. The fruit fly came before you. Don't get so haughty. Again, we're seeing that man has a unique capacity towards arrogance, towards haughtiness, which is a corollary, which is an analog of rejecting God. Again, that, that, that's an, it, it, exhibiting God's, uh, man's free will. In addition, why, for a third reason, says the Talmud, why was man created last? Because what, well, what happens right afterwards is, it's Shabbos. So man created and doesn't need to wait to fulfill the mitzvah. Right away you go into the mitzvah. And again, a mitzvah is going to be the central lever through which the purpose of the world is going to be fulfilled. Man's going to receive goodness via the mitzvah. Man's going to exhibit God's dominion over the world also via mitzvah. Again, another overlap. Both objectives are accomplished when man does a mitzvah. Man does a mitzvah, they get rewarded. They get the goodness that God wants to dispense and dole out to us. Man does a mitzvah. And why does man do a mitzvah? Because man is acknowledging God. A mitzvah is a tacit acknowledgement of God's dominion, and thus every mitzvah changes, so to speak, the glory of God, the kingdom of God, from autocracy to kingdom. And finally, says the Talmud, the fourth reason why the man was created last is because 
first you assemble the arena and then you invite in the guest. It gives an example. You have a king. King makes a party. Everything gets set in place and then finally the guests arrive. The, the goal of the party is the guests. And therefore everything else is set into place. Everything else is put into place beforehand, so that way when the guests arrive, everything is ready. Again, the goal of creation is man, and therefore everything else of creation is first put into place, and then man is put into place as well. So again, we see a lot of these ideas here about, again, the creation being about man, about man's free will, about man's ability to do mitzvos, about man's ability also to reject that, and that being in his hand. Thus, man and man's free will is the thing that makes man unique. And by the way, again, another aside, man is created in the image of God. What is the one area in which we are most similar to God? That's our free will. We can make choices. We can do one thing or another thing. We're not programmed to behave in one way or another. And in that way, in that sense, we're greater than angels. Angels are spiritually loftier than us, but they don't, have any uh, dynamic capabilities. They can't choose. They have to behave in one way. Animals, they're lower than us on a spiritual scale. But again, they're very, their life is very inflexible. They're stagnant. They can't have variability. Man, we're like God because we can make choices. Like God can make choices. So our free will is the thing that makes us most similar to God on one hand. On the other hand, it's also the thing that makes us the most distant from God because the only thing in the world that can reject God is man's free will. Angels can't do it. Animals can't do it. Plants can't do it. The sun and the moon, the stars, the galaxies cannot do it. Only man's free will can make that left turn, so to speak, and turn away from God. It's kind of ironic that the epicenter of everything, the good and the bad, the choices, the, the purpose of existence, where we're close to God and where we're distanced from God are all coalesced at the point of free will that we have within us. And this is the ability that we have. This is the lever, like we said, to bring about both purposes of creation, both the glory of heaven. By choosing good, we expand the kingdom of God and by choosing good, we become worthy. We earn God giving us good, and thus choosing good is the correct answer to both questions or the implementation of both purposes given to us, both both ideas that we see in, in classical Jewish literature of why God created the world. And this is really the answer as, as they're really – they're different parts of one process. There's like the cause and then the effect. The cause is – well, we bring God into our lives. We bring God into our world. We do mitzvos, and therefore we're bringing God here. We're exposing, so to speak, God in the world. What's the result? The result is we become connected to God. We follow his dicta. We obey his instructions. Well, we're now connected. A natural consequence of someone being connected to God is that they are connected to God. Well, what does that mean? How is that played out? That's played out by reward and punishment. The degree that someone is connected to God, that's the degree of goodness that God dispenses to them. So, and we'll talk about more of that in a second, but that's just, I, I wanted to kind of give the framework of how these two answers are really two halves or two parts of one process. So just kind of how this plays out. There is an idea, a, theor, a theme in, in Jewish literature called tikkun olam which means to fix the world. In modern parlance, the word tikkun olam has been appropriated for things that are very distant from its original intention. Where did the words, litakein olam, to fix the world, where did those words originate? Where's the first time they are uh, written down? What, what, what's the origin of that terminology? The origin is in the prayer that we say, Multiple times, m- multiple times a day, Aleinu, Aleinu Shabbat Don't recall. At the end of the prayer service, we say Litakein Olam B'Machutzakai to fix the world with the kingdom of God. That's what it means. It means to fix the world with the kingdom of God. That is another way of saying everything that we just said previously. Why 
did God create the world? To give man the ability to fix the world with the kingdom of God. How does that play out? Well, it plays out in a worldwide scale, and it plays out on an individual scale. It plays out on a worldwide scale. Well, we have a world, and it's created by God, but God is hidden, so to speak, beneath the veneer, beneath the facade of the world. It's possible for people to go live their whole lives and never acknowledge him, to be wowed at the beauty of creation, to uh, study uh, astronomy, to be a physicist, to be totally immersed in God's world, but never acknowledge the artist, the engineer, the creator behind it all. That's a broken world. Our objective on a national scale, and really objective not just of our nation, but all of humanity, is to fix that broken world. The world is broken because the world itself does not testify, or at least initially, to God unless we do the work of exposing that. And on a more individual level, our sages tell us that man is olam katan, man is a mini world. In our world itself, in our life, we can also have that same malady, everything within us. Your heart beats 100,000 times a day. Every single one of them is guided by God, like we said. Principle, principle number one, nothing happens in the world. Everything is reliant on God. So every breath that I take, it's God giving me life. Every time my heart beats, it's God giving me life. Every time everything works perfectly, it's God giving me life. But do we acknowledge it? Some people do, but some people don't. That's a broken world, not just on a big scale, but on a little scale. And again, our job is to fix the big world, but it's also about fixing the little world, exposing God within ourselves, exhibiting God in our life and our behavior and our practices and our priorities and our beliefs, and having that flow out to change the world at large. And again, all those are fulfilled by free will, and all those engender the goodness that God wants to give us. In fact, we even have an entire festival, an entire holiday oriented, dedicated on this question, on the purpose of creation question, and that is, of course, Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is the anniversary of day six of creation, the day when God created man. Why is Rosh Hashanah not the anniversary of day one where God created the entire universe? Well, the answer is the entire universe, the purpose, was only accomplished on day six. And therefore, day six is the beginning of when really things start happening. What happens before that is really irrelevant to our uh, to our subject because the purpose wasn't completed until until day six, until when, when Adam arrives, Adam and Eve. And thus, you don't make an anniversary of the beginning of the process. You make an anniversary of the completion of the process. And Adam is around. And our sages tell us that Adam, even though there were some problems later on, as we all know the story really well, uh, the Midrash tells us that all the animals wanted to bow down to Adam. And Adam said, no, 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 you don't bow down to me. You bow down to God. And thus, the purpose of creation was already being accomplished on a certain extent where Adam goes and bows bows down to God. Adam chooses to accept God. And by doing that, Adam creates for himself goodness by cleaving to God. And every year, this process gets renewed. So Rosh Hashanah is called the Day of Judgment. Why is it the Day of Judgment? It's a Day of Judgment because every year we revisit this ideal that's the purpose of the world. And therefore, every year, we ask the question, okay, who is contributing towards accomplishing the purpose of the world? Who is an asset towards augmenting God's dominion of the world? Who is contributing towards upgrading God, so to speak, from an autocrat to a king? Who is the one who is cleaving to God with their mitzvahs, with their activities, and therefore making themselves a worthy receptacle of God's goodness? That's judged every year on, on Rosh Hashanah. So, in effect, what I'm trying to say in everything I've said till now is that there's two answers, but really those two answers are just different halves of that same whole. And therefore, I think we can say that when Ramchal, when Rabbi Moshe Hamutzato tells us that the purpose of the world is for God to give us goodness, he is in fact not arguing with the prophet Isaiah. In fact, he is just telling us the relevant component for us of how we fit into that picture. For us, the reason why 
or even what motivates us is that we did goodness or God created the world so he could give us pleasure, he could give us goodness because that's what he did. That's what he wanted. He wanted to create someone, an entity that can be a worthy receptacle of that goodness. What I want to do now is really understand this idea. Again, it's a very powerful idea that the reason why God, who again was perfect and lacked nothing, and the reason why he chose to create the world the objective, the purpose of the world is to give us humans, specifically humans, who use our free will to make good choices, to get good results from that choices, to get eternal pleasure. It's a very powerful idea that the goal of everything is that we should have it good. We should have eternal pleasure. It's an amazing idea. I want to read to you uh, two citations of Ramchal where he elaborates on this point. The first one is a more general view of how this works out. And then the second one is a more technical, systematic explanation of the various components of this process, of this procedure. Because there's a lot of variables. Now, there's, again, we live in a very huge world and we're giving very detailed instructions in the Torah. And then the pleasure, the reward is all my buzz. The next world all those parts all fit into this grand purpose for perfect reasons. And he's going to kind of list them out strand by strand elements of, uh, of, of, this, of this idea that underscores everything that we do. It is interesting, my grandfather pointed out, that Ramchal, the great titan of, of Jewish philosophy, he begins many of his great works with this idea. So, for example, the path of the just, Masil Sisharim, sometimes called the way of the upright, it begins, the first several uh, paragraphs, talk specifically about this idea. God created us to give us pleasure. Wow, what an idea. What a great way to start the book. The book Derech Hashem, the way of God, also begins with this idea. Das Tvunos also begins with, with this idea. Klach Pesachachma also. And each time he's presenting it from a different angle. Once it's from our perspective, once it's from God's perspective, once it's from the Kabbalistic perspective, but it, it's all kind of create the same, the same idea. So what I want to do is I want to read, um, two citations. The first one we'll read from Masil Sasharm from Path of the Just, alternatively called Way of the Upright, how he begins and the, the points that he makes to answer this or to explain, to elucidate the question of why did God create us? And I encourage everyone to read this because Ramchal is someone who is very uh, succinct in his writing, very precise in his writing. Each kind of each sentence, each line has a lot of deep meaning. And then the big picture is also perfectly engineered to create a perfect visual image a perfect philosophical, intellectual framework that everything makes sense, kind of the big picture, but also every line kind of fits in and, and how it's presented and how it's organized logically. It's amazing. So he begins like this. Yesoda Chasidus of Shosh Avoda, the foundation of piety and the root of perfect service of God. And I'm just, it's written, written in Hebrew. I'm just going to translate it as we go on. Is that a person should, should clarify within themselves what is your duty in the world? The first is the first step of any pursuit of greatness, is to ask yourself the question, what am I here for? What is my responsibilities in the world? And what should I focus on? What should be my objective in everything that I toil upon all the days of my life? So it's a question that's, it's such a powerful question. What am I living for? Why am I here? What am I here to accomplish? What must I accomplish? What are my responsibilities? What should I focus on every day of my life? It's a question that I imagine 99% of Americans or people in the world never ask themselves. And it's the most important question. What am I living for? Why am I here? Everyone knows that we're here and then we die and then it's a great mystery. And people never ask the question, I'm I'm given precious time, precious life, precious years. Why? What's the goal? What's the objective? What must I do to properly live this life? And he tells you, okay, I'll tell you what it is. He quotes our sages. And this, again, is a composite of all the wisdom of our sages. And here's the winning line. Man was only created for one purpose. And again, we see he's orienting the question from man's perspective. What, why am I here for? What's my purpose? Man was created only for one purpose, and that is to have the pleasure of God. 
and to bask in the glory of his divine presence. presence. For this is the greatest pleasure in the world, and this is the truest delight in the world, and this is greater than any pleasure that's possibly conceivable and possibly imaginable. Where do we receive this pleasure? And the place of this pleasure is, truthfully, Olam Abba, the next world. That world was created, was engineered to be a place where God gives us pleasure. However, the means to achieve that pleasure is here, is fulfilling mitzvos, is obeying the will of God here. You obey the will of God here, and that makes you qualified, that makes you eligible for the pleasure of of basking in the divine presence there. And he quotes some sources to substantiate that. This world is akin to a vestibule, to a corridor before the next world. And we do the mitzvos, and those are the activities that make us eligible, that render us uh, eligible to enter and to flourish in the next world. And the place of doing the mitzvos, the place of preparation is only here. Once someone's dead, once they're no longer in this world, they can no longer prepare themselves for the next world. And therefore, we were placed here initially so that we could do these steps and do the activities and act the way that makes us worthy once we get there, once we arrive at the palace doors, to be worthy of flourishing and being, having the capabilities of absorbing the divine pleasure that we get there. And then he adds that true perfection is only when man cleaves to God. And this is, again, this is, we read, if you read this quickly, you can miss his point. His point is, is that only God is good. That's the only thing which is actually completely, perfectly good. And therefore, every other good is relative good. There's only one absolute good, and there's everything else is only relative. And therefore, the degree that some that someone or something is connected to God, that's the degree of goodness that it has. And therefore, the degree of reward and pleasure that we could have, the connection that we can have to good, that all hinges on how much we cleave to God. And it's almost like a, a very technical way of understanding this. Pleasure, or at least the highest level of pleasure, is by definition the pleasure of God, because that's the only thing that's really good. And therefore, the more a person cleaves to God, that's the more a person is connected to God, and therefore, the more connection a person has to the greatest pleasure that is possible. And he reiterates that in order for a person to accomplish, to achieve that great pleasure, they have to toil first over here to acquire it and to cleave to God via the strength of their actions. And the natural consequence of that is to uh, to uh, uh, to be able to be someone who is connected to God and therefore connected to goodness and therefore having the goodness as well. So again, he's presenting to us the answer to our question, what's the purpose of the world? If I were to say to do mitzvos, it's a correct answer. Because doing mitzvos are doing the actions that connect someone to God that give them the pleasure. But he starts again a step earlier. And that is the ultimate goal, at least from our perspective, is for us to receive the goodness that we could get via doing the mitzvos because the mitzvos connect us to God. So again, there's a lot to unpack there, but the bottom line is that the goal, the reason why God created us is to give us pleasure, and that pleasure is accomplished in all about, and that pleasure is achieved. The ticket that we get, the golden ticket that we get to be able to get a foot in the door is the mitzvos. And like he explains, the mitzvos is connected to God, and therefore connection to God is inherently goodness, and therefore we could cash into that goodness once we are oriented in a way that we are capable of doing that. So that is how he begins his book, Masil his Charm, and the whole book is, okay, how do we do that? How do we make sure that we really are perfect and we are good and we are cleaved to good so that way we can uh, cash in on the post-mortem pleasure that is the goal of why we were created? And I want to just point out that, you know, what he, he's presenting, and of course this is not his idea, this is the oldest idea in Judaism, is that there's two worlds. There's what's called this world and there's next world. Which one of those worlds is the goal? Well, the answer is it depends. Our world is the goal for toil, for work, for creation of the reality that 
is the goal. So from a productivity perspective, this world is the goal. From the ultimate perspective, which is the reward, well, next world is the goal. So these two worlds are connected. They're intimately connected because only via the corridor, only via the vestibule can you get to the ballroom, to the hallway, to, to, uh, to, to the, uh, to the palace at the end of the door, at the, at the end of the, uh, of the corridor. So on one hand, from a, from a productivity, from a toil perspective, this world is the ultimate goal because once you get there, you can't do any work. On the other hand, from a ultimate perspective, from a consumption perspective, the next world is the ultimate goal because only there can you get reward for the activities that you did over here. And the way the Talmud presents it, uh, it's a nice, clever quip. Someone who toils before Shabbos gets to eat and consume on Shabbos. If someone does not toil before Shabbos, what will they eat on Shabbos? This is an exact parallel to this uh, relationship, to this timeline of this world to the next world. Before Shabbos, well, then you could work. You could bake, you could cook, you could knead, you could do all the work beforehand to prepare. And by preparing, you're creating the entities that you can consume once Shabbos comes. Shabbos comes, you can't work anymore. You can't be, you can't bake, you can't cook, you can't work to produce. But now it's time of consumption. So is the goal Friday? Is the goal Shabbos? Well, Friday the goal is to work, to prepare, and Shabbos the goal is to enjoy. This world is to prepare, is to work, and next world is to enjoy the quote unquote fruits of our labor that we accomplished over here. Now, in Derech Hashem, in the way of God, which is a much more philosophical book, he gets into a little bit more of the details the philosophical components of this entire ecosystem. The chapter is literally called The Purpose of Creation. And it's it's the second chapter. The first chapter is dealing with the idea of God, the Jewish definition of God. And then the next chapter, like we try to follow the same kind of logical progression, the next chapter is, okay, well, God exists. Well, why did it create the world? And the third chapter is about humanity and humanity's role in, in, in being the vehicle to effectuate the purpose of the world and to accomplish and to be receptacles of the goodness, uh, which is the goal of creation. But because it's a more philosophical book, it's a more, it's, it's, he's going to deal with more technicalities of how this works out. It's almost as if Derech Hashem, it's the way of God, it's, it's the philosophy, it's the how do you understand it intellectually, Basil Sharma is okay, now let's walk through, let's actually live it, and therefore it's much more going to be oriented around, uh, around guiding a person in each step as they take uh, their steps uh, through uh, this corridor, through this world, preparing themselves for Omaba. So I want to go through this again. This is chapter two, and this is not the whole thing. I cut out some parts, but I want to kind of go through the various steps that he outlines. Uh, to answer our question. The answer is the same. He's going to give us more, more color, more detail of how these things work out. So he begins that the purpose of creation is that God gives goodness from him to something which is not him. That's the purpose. That's the goal. How much goodness are we going to get? What's the degree of goodness that God wants to give us. Well, remember, God is perfect. God is, and therefore, if God is perfect, the goodness that He wants to give is also perfect. He's not going to, he's not going to suffice with giving a little bit of goodness. That's not going to fulfill His desire. His desire is that He's good and He's perfectly good, and therefore He wants to do good, and therefore He wants to do good perfectly, and therefore He's not going to do good, kind of a little bit of good, ten percent of good. He wants, it's got to be hundred percent. It's got to be perfect goodness. And therefore, it's going to be the most goodness that it's possible for the people or the entities that he's going to create to be able to absorb. Okay, so that's the, the goal is to do this. The degree is as much as possible. And the nature of the pleasure is that the pleasure of God. And he explains, because only God is truthfully good, 
Therefore, it's not possible to have perfect goodness that is divorced from God. Because God is the perfect goodness, and therefore to give perfect goodness, you have to be able to kind of make that connection with the receptacle of the goodness and the thing, which is the entity of true goodness, of perfect goodness. But that's not possible. It's not possible for us to be God. Of course not. So how is it? So this is a dilemma, right? God wants to do good, but because God's perfect, he wants to do good perfectly. And therefore, he wants to give, well, what's the perfect good? The perfect good is only God. So how is it possible to give something which is not God the perfect good? Amazing question. In addition, the nature of God's existence is inherent. God's goodness is not something which is external to him. It's essential to him. It's inherent within him. And therefore, the nature of the goodness that he wants to give us is also something that we don't get externally. It's something we get, that we earn, so to speak, something we have inherently. And, and, and there's a lot of moving parts here, but true reward and true pleasure is not something which is external. It's not like you did this, you got a lollipop. The true feeling of goodness is when it's something which is earned, which is inherent. The person who gets the goodness becomes the goodness and therefore lives the goodness, inherently is the goodness. Well, if that's the pleasure of God, it's not possible for us to be God. So how do we get the goodness? So what's the loophole, so to speak, around this? How could someone inherently be like God? Not be inherently, inherently God, that's of course not possible theologically. But how is it possible for someone to be like God, to earn the goodness of being like God and therefore being the, uh, the individual who's the greatest receptacle of God's goodness because they earned it inherently? And therefore, this is how he arrives at the conclusion that God gave us the abilities and the tools to perfect ourselves to make us better and gooder and more like God and therefore more connected to God and therefore more connected to goodness and therefore more connected to more perfect goodness and therefore to be able to receive the perfect goodness that is the desire of creation. And he ends off this piece that this is, of course, only possible with man. Only man who has the free will can earn and become this. An angel is something which is this and can become it and therefore it's not theirs. It's not inherent. It's, 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 it's something which they got. And it's not, they didn't become it, and therefore the reward that they get or the life that they experience, the pleasure of God that they experience is not the ultimate goal of creation. It's not the animals, it's not the angels, not the things that are below us spiritually, not the things that are above us spiritually, but us, which are this mixture of animal and angel, of spiritual and physical, creating this cocktail of free will. We have a soul, we have a body, we have a Yetzitovi, a Yetzara, all of that creating this ability for us to choose good, to do mitzvahs, and therefore expose God in the world, and therefore become the goodness that we are going to exhibit in Olam Abba. On the other hand, of course, we could choose the opposite, and therefore, through us, we can, uh, God achieved his goal of creation, and which is to, again, create a vessel which is the recipient of his goodness, and that's, of course, man, and that is measured by how much a person is complete, how much a person is connected to God. The goodness must be complete, and therefore man must become it, and only through man can the purpose of creation be fulfilled, and the goodness is the greatest goodness, which is only exhibited in Olam Abba. That is the very long way of answering the question, what is God's purpose in creation? And just to recap what we said, the purpose is presented in different ways, in different books, and in different, in different elucidations of Jewish philosophy. And they're not disagreeing. They're all various parts of this complete architectural, uh, uh, complete intellectual architecture. And for us, I think a simple way to distill it is that God created us because he loves us and because he wanted to do good to us, but did not subsist, will not subsist with doing only a little bit of good to us, wants to do the best kind of good to us, and that is something that when we become good, 
we become worthy of having divine godly goodness for all eternity in Olam Abba, and that is, of course, done via mitzvos. The next subject I would like to cover, I think it's another natural extension of principle number one. It's going to kind of take it from the theoretical, from the philosophical, to the more practical. Because as we mentioned uh, last time, these principles are a framework. They're a foundation. When we talk about emuna, like the Ramban says, the goal of all the mitzvahs is to have emuna. The Talmud says that as well. All sorts of th- the goal is that we have emuna. That is a much higher level. That's a much more intimate level. It's a much more instinctual level than the kind of intellectual framework that is the 13 principles. So what, what I want to do before we move on to principle number two and three, which are going to go back to the theoretical and the philosophical and the theological, I want to take some time to dwell on the question of, okay, beyond the framework, beyond the intellectual, theological, uh, philosophical framework of what we believe to understand the vast gulf that separates that, the belief element, and the actual emuna and how it actually plays out within us. So that's going to be a subject that we'll, um, we'll cover uh, next time. And I look forward to doing that uh, together with everyone here.